afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much for coming to what is our initial event to start our new um, lecture series. And uh, really delighted to see you all here. My name is Beata Kampen and also is part of the Institute of Global Health Innovation. And our lecture uh, series will start off with a talk on TB today. And before I get to anything in substance, I need to tell you that you're only allowed to get out of this building through the main entrance, otherwise the revolving door gets jammed up or so, so that is one thing. And the other thing is please stay at the end, because we have a reception with wine and whatever, juice and stuff that people want. I didn't put it on the website, because when we had the launch for the centre, we had all sorts of people come in to the launch, <laughs> basically for the wine, who didn't have anything to do with global health or the children or anything, so we, we figured it would be better to keep it a secret, so it's for you, but don't tell your friends. Right, so um, I have a couple of introductory slides, and the first thing to do is to actually thank the people from the Institute of Global Health Innovation and also Krupa from CICH who've managed to set this all up for us uh, today. So the CICH um, is really there to facilitate research partnerships in international child health. We have a lot of this through Imperial already, but we also have a lot uh, with other institutions. And we are one of the centers within the Institute of Global Health Innovation, and you have here the list of all the other centers, and a few delegates from these centers are also here today, which is uh, lovely to see. And the IGHI runs a monthly, now bi-monthly, seminar series as well and our seminar this month adds to uh, their portfolio. So uh, the Centre of International Child Health is uh, a partner, and we are here to create a hub for the activities around international uh, children's health. And we are keen to facilitate really the interactions between teams who might not necessarily work together. And the motto of this, world's, uh, this year's World TB Day, in, in fact, is um, Unite to End TB. And it means that people really from all sectors should be coming together to work together because tuberculosis is not just a question for microbiologists, not just a question for immunologists, not just a question for epidemiologists. Although today we brought you some talks that will uh, cut, on to, uh, cut through all of these issues. So um, welcome to our new seminar series. You here have the flyer and there are a few copies of outside that will um, give you the dates and the topics for the subsequent uh, uh, seminars. We have something on adolescent mental health, we have something on the microbiome, we have something on malaria, we have something on vaccines. So throughout the year, there is uh, sort of taster sessions of these areas of uh, child health that we felt we could prioritize in this uh, first year. And the people who work with me in the center have each taken forward different topics which relate to the science that they also do and today's uh, session was put together by James together with Chris and Steve. And please stay for the drink. So I'm now gonna hand over to, oh yeah, the other thing I must say is there will be tweets throughout the sessions. The, um, the handle is, uh, was on that slide, uh, Imperial IGHI, Imperial CICH. But I think Joe and your team, you're primarily mention, managing that and if anyone else wants to tweet, please go ahead. And I now hand over to um, James to introduce our first speaker. <laughs> Hello everyone, thanks very much um, Beata and, um, and welcome everyone, thanks for everyone for coming. So what we tr have tried to do today is we're certainly not trying to teach people um, about tuberculosis, it's not a lecture, this is a seminar series, it's really we're giving you three little small vignettes, little kind of tasters in a way to promote discussion, to promote thinking. Um, they're not long, they're sort of 15, 20 minutes each. The main purpose of today is to try and facilitate as much discussion between people as possible. Ideally discussion that translates between specialties, discussion that is per pan specialty and that is of interest to people from different backgrounds. So we're certainly not trying to teach you all about the mathematical modelling of TB or all about immunology or all about clinical care of children with TB. That would be days and days and days. So on that note, I'm going to introduce with great pleasure the first speaker, who's Dr. Peter Dodd, who, um, who was at Imperial for many years, uh, a number of years ago. He's currently at Sheffield. I've done a lot of work with Pete over the last five years, um, and Pete is an excellent um, many things. And I'm going to let him introduce his topic, but he's going to talk about mathematical modelling of uh, how it can be used to think about childhood TV. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction and the invitation. 
uh, I, I didn't really occur to me somehow and, until now that I'm starting this, this uh, seminar series rolling, but uh, uh, it looks that's both intimidating and, and uh, an honour. So this is going to be a bit of a whistle stop TV, uh, or whistle stop TV, whistle stop tour. Uh, and I'm not going to say too much in detail about any of the topics, but you you can ask uh, more uh, afterwards or or at the reception if if it uh, takes your fancy. So the the background to TV globally, as you uh, probably know, is that it now ranks as the uh, the number one infectious uh, cause of death globally. Uh, with over 10 million incident cases uh, estimated in 2015. Now, uh, TV is declining slightly, so the Millennium Development Goal around starting to decline the, the epidemic of TV is a, is a tick, but you can see it's, it's a pretty feeble uh, rate of decline. So if we think about what the um, corresponding picture is for children, um, well, actually we can't. Um, because there isn't a corresponding sort of time series estimate of what's happening uh, for estimates uh, of TV incidents in children. So in actual fact, it was 2012 when the first WHO official estimate of uh, TV incidents in children under 15 was produced. It's worth stopping a minute and asking why, you know, what, why that is. So first of all, a bit of background for, for you, which I guess many of you will be uh, familiar with, but... You know, children are at particularly high risk of developing disease after they become infected with TB, and the kinds of disease they get uh, are different in spectrum to uh, adults, uh, and they, they're more likely to get severe forms of TB. They're less likely to get classical pulmonary TB, and part of that means that the types of disease they get are harder to dis distinguish from other things. They're harder to get culturable samples from, or samples you can use in other uh, tests. So uh, that makes... TB genuinely, in children, genuinely more challenging to diagnose. But there's also, so, you know, in terms of numbers that go to WHO that go into these estimates, there's first this diagnosis stage, but there's also a reporting stage. And actually, because of perceptions that uh, TB in children wasn't really a big public health problem, because it didn't transmit typically to uh, other people, the systems around TB notifications in children and ag for aggregating those data and passing them on were... Uh, um, less robust. So basically the reason was that actually the data uh, on, uh, on which to base estimates in children were much weaker than they were for adults. So I, I went, most of you are probably not modelers. I should say a little bit about you know, what a model is and why is it making an appearance here and what modeling might you already be familiar with by some other means. So a mathematical model is kind of a formalization, a set of rules to quantitative relate, relate things, right? Some, some picture of how the world works that's actually formalised in such a way that you could write it down, give it to somebody else, they could reproduce it, they could scrutinise your ideas, they could implement it again in a, uh, uh, in a computer and spit out the same numbers that you did. One model that you might be familiar with if you, if you have a background in TB uh, is Stiebelow's rules, right? So these are a really simple set of rules that were developed based on epidemiological data in the first half of the 20th century uh, and summarised uh, in the following way. So his, his first rule was that deaths, incidence and prevalence were in a 1 to 2 to 4 ratio, which basically means around a 50% case fatality rate and a duration of about two years. I should say these numbers don't really apply anymore, but they're, they're still useful for, for thinking about TV. Um, another one is a rule that relates the risk, annual risk of infection to the incidence of disease, or, or really the prevalence of disease more, more relevantly. And if you think about what that means in, in, in simpler terms, it means that for every smear positive case, every year that they're out there in, in the community, they're likely to be infecting 10 other people over the course of that year. Finally, there was a rule about how likely you are to then go on and develop disease over the course of your uh, lifetime. So if you if you study TB epidemiology at all, you probably come across these rules. And if you haven't studied modelling, I would like to say, you know, actually, this is a model. This is a really simple model. It's a, a set of quantitative rules for relating different quantities. So how does modelling come into the story for TB in children? Well, I've already told you that uh, the direct data on uh, incidence in children is, is really weak. So what, uh, what James and I did uh, around this was basically try to say, well, OK, Let's say that we, we think the data in adults are better. 
what do we think the data in adults imply about the risks of, first of all, infection in children, and then using older data from the pre-chemotherapy literature on the risks of progression to disease in children, uh, what do you think that is going to tell us about uh, incident cases? So this is kind of a two-stage two model, right? So you've got one model that relates adult disease to risks of infection in children, and then a second stage, which is around the risk of progression from infection to, uh, to disease. So the only comments I'd make there are that because we're not making use of, at the start, the, the data on notifications in, in children directly, it means we can compare back to the notification data in children and try and make an assessment of how big the gap is. Uh, and the second general comment, which applies to all of this really, is that you know, all of these stages and all of the ingredients in them include some sort of uncertainty. And really you need to try and quantify that uncertainty and propagate it through so that you fairly represent it in your conclusions. In a sense, all these, all these assumptions are buying, are buying you more uh, ability to say things, but at the price of dragging in more uncertainty. So it was slightly more complicated than that in terms of the things we have, but the, two, the stages are, you're not meant to be able to read this by the way, but the, there are these st still these two stages, so a model of infection and a model of progression to disease. But just to say that you know, the model of progression to disease uh, was very strongly dependent on age, which you'll hear more about, uh, it was dependent on HIV status and BCG vaccination, which I guess you'll hear something about, uh, also made a difference. I mentioned Stiegler's rule as an example, uh, partially because it's a, a, an example, but also because it, it, it runs through all of these bits of work. So here's a kind of updated version of Stiegler based on more modern uh, surveys where there's been both a, a prevalence survey, so you've got an objective measure of disease but also a measure of the uh, rate of infection. This graph here gives you an idea of the sort of way that you go about representing uncertainty in, in an ingredient like that. So instead of having a single quantity that you're going to use, you assign it a distribution, and you try to propagate that distribution through the process you have relating with quantity. So to quickly run through a few results from that exercise, which in, in our initial study was looking at the 22 highest burden countries, we generated these, these kind of spermatozoidal blobs are the uh, country estimates in young children and old children, and the dots are the corresponding number of notifications for 2010. And you can see that you know, it, the pattern's quite variable, but on the whole, the dots are substantially lower than the central weight of these blobs, and the, the difference between them is bigger in the younger children than in the older children. So actually, if you, you know, kind of tot up these numbers, you can make an assessment of how many, what proportion of children do you think are actually uh, being detected and notified. And for, for kids, uh, that ended up being around a third of cases. So by, by comparison, the, num the corresponding number for adults globally is meant to be around two-thirds. So two-thirds of incident cases of TB get diagnosed and notified, which is already pretty bad. But for children, that number is more like one-third. So that, that's, we've, we've updated this work since, uh, and that, that, that's still more or less the case. And this is now part of the official WHO process for generating estimates of TB incidents in children, which in 2015 were now around uh, one million. There are other things that come out of this in terms of you know, epidemiological understanding. So this is a, a graph of the proportion of TB incidence that's in children, that's percentage, versus the TB incidence in that given country. So Peter Donald kind of made this prediction uh, probably 20 years ago that actually those things should correlate, and they should correlate both because of an ecological correlation between uh, countries that having high TB burdens having lots of children, but also because in Places where you have lots of TB, kids tend to get infected earlier on, on average, and at earlier ages, uh, children are more susceptible to progression to disease. So those two things give you a kind of correlation. And interestingly here, the countries which kind of outlie that pattern are those which have the highest HIV burden. And HIV is more of a risk factor for adults than for children in terms of the population, just because more adults have uh, HIV. So. I told you that only about a third of children uh, are getting detected and notified. So that should already tell you there's not going to be a lot of da direct data on drug resistance in children. Actually, it's even worse than that because if you have a child, it's probably still the minority of uh, cases that you're going to be able to get a culture confirmation from, a, a cultural sample. And then if you think about the, 
where TB is and the capacity for then doing uh, uh, drug resistance testing, you can tell that by then you're getting really a very tiny fraction of uh, the number of incident cases getting uh, drug resistance tests. Also that. So we, in common with other people who've looked at drug resistance, uh, instead worked with the proportion in that area of drug resistance among treatment naive adults. So the systematic review evidence to support the relationship between uh, the proportion of drug resistance in children and the proportion of drug resistance in treatment naive adults, that's somehow representing uh, what's the level of drug resistance that's being transmitted as opposed to uh, building up through um, uh, early treatment. So we, in this exercise, we really wanted to move away from just thinking about MDR to thinking about a, a broader spectrum of drug resistance. So MDR is the kind of overlap here between rifampicin resistance and isoniazid res resistance. We also wanted to think about second line injectable resistance and fluoroquinolone resistance, the overlap of which is, is XGR. So we were able to kind of examine the patterns by WHO region. This, this graph at the top is the proportion that are drug susceptible. So as this falls, you're talking about more drug resistance. So here in the WHO Euro region, you're looking at uh, about 60% having some form of drug resistance. If you're not familiar with the WHO regions, the Euro region includes all of the former Soviet republics and uh, Russia. So um, that's what's different about that region. These are the second line resistances here, which are substantially more uncertain, reflecting actually the fact that there's quite poor data on this even in adults. If you look at the, if you think about just MDR and map out where it is kind of distorting areas to capture the, the burden of MDR uh, TB in children, but colouring by the proportion of TB in children that's MDR, you get this kind of double story going on. So the majority of MDR cases in children are in places like South Africa, Nigeria, India, which actually have uh, very many children, but relatively low proportions of children with MDR. Whereas the very high proportions of MDR are in these former Soviet republics. I think Belarus here is uh, topping the chart with the majority of uh, uh, cases being MDR, or worse. Actually, in a slightly, this is slightly parenthetical, but in a separate uh, piece of work, um, uh, I and Ryan Huben were looking at the burden of latent infection. And there, if you want to think about, you know, 15-year-old and what's their... Uh, risk of having been infected. Actually, that doesn't just depend on their risk of infection in a given year. It's kind of an accumulated history of their risk of infection over the 15 years they've been alive, right? So you need to think a bit more about how, how risks of infection have been changing by time. Uh, so this exercise is not specifically aimed at children, in fact, but we did estimate the uh, numbers globally of uh, children under 15 who've been um, infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. So... Uh, Finally, uh, I'll just tell you about some uh, more recent work looking at the uh, global burden of TB mortality from um, TB. Said each of those twice, but at least that's emphasizing here. So here, what we, I mean, basically this was a case fatality based approach. So we were starting out with the uh, WHO estimates of incidence and then disaggregating them by things that really make a difference to case fatality. So first of all, disaggregating by age, because case fatality rates are higher for younger children than they are for older children. And actually we were doing that using our uh, model, which includes features of natural history. Then the other big thing that makes a difference to whether you die or not is whether you get onto treatment. So there we were using the notification data as a proxy for having been treated, and the difference between the notification data and the incidence uh, for, for untreated. Then down here we were disaggregating by HIV and ART um, status. So most of the data on case fatality uh, was from a systematic review. There was also a systematic review on the risks of uh, HIV that was used to uh, disaggregate by. So if you, if you run those numbers through, and then you, you come out with a, a, a total of around 240,000 uh, deaths for 2015 from TB. Uh, and you can split it up. Here I split it up by treatment status, by age, and also by HIV. So there's quite a lot going on. Um, but the things to notice here are, first of all, that looking down at this top bit versus this bit, 
this is the children who are over five years old and this is the children who are under five years old. So actually over 80% of this is in the younger uh, age bracket. The other thing to notice is that these slivers here are the children who are on treatment. So actually 96% of the deaths here are from children who are not on treatment and that basically means they're avoidable deaths. Well, as long as you can find them and get them on treatment because the outcomes on treatment are really good. If you think about what this uh, total of um, deaths in the under five group means in terms of the kind of rankings of causes of death in children, so this is actually for, for neonates, uh, that would bring it in on around number six, I think, just around here, uh, on the global list that is put together by uh, what used to be called CHO. So they've never included TB in their estimates because they, they solely base their estimates on data that comes out of fiber registration uh, systems, which for TB uh, in children uh, are problematic for the same reasons as uh, notifications. So I realize this is a bit of a, a whiz through, but you know, I was given this question, uh, can mathematical models tell us about TB burden and uh, epidemiology in children? And no surprise, my answer is going to be yes, I think they can. Uh, and here, you know, we're thinking about modeling as a tool to kind of glue together diverse pieces of <coughs> evidence to give you uh, 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 more of an idea about the whole picture. And there's particular value in, in the context of childhood TV, which you're thinking about an area where actually the direct data are very weak. So, you know, one of the things I think this is helping to do is to motivate um, better data, right? Because if you get better data, you can then confront your, your model with new data, uh, and where it's discrepant, you learn something about uh, uh, the assumptions that went into your model and how they might be wrong. On the right here, by the way, is a graph of the total number of notifications in children globally over time. And you can see that actually it's nearly 10 times what it was uh, in around 2000. I'm not saying that's to do with modeling, right? Because we only arrived on this picture around here. And clearly there's been a lot of work uh, by WHO and others in, in trying to motivate uh, data collection and reporting. But if you, if you have the, the, the statistic reported, it's a great motivator to pay some more attention to it and uh, uh, strengthen systems for data. Um, so I've talked about modeling just from this perspective here. I mean, I think the other thing to bear in mind about modeling of this kind is that one of the principal motivators for doing it is that you can apply it to interventions and what happens if you change things, which is something you can't really do with uh, statistical models as opposed to mathematical models. So just finally, thank you to the many other uh, people who are involved in these several pieces of work, and the people who uh, facilitated it and paid for it. Uh, and there's a bit of a bibliography um, uh, of the papers that I've talked, the results that I've talked about here, and also other results uh, uh, in this area which are, which are relevant. So we're doing questions at the end, I think. Oh, right? so yeah. We'll take a few minutes to take some questions specific to this, and then we'll have a decent period of time at the end to um, to talk of questions that cross cut. So, if there's anyone who wants to ask Pete anything based on what you've just talked about, and one thing I would I would ask is, is maybe you could go into a bit more about the interventions thing and then how that fits because the, these models you've talked about have been describing what's happening now with known. So maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I, I maybe already said, uh, yeah, so, I mean, people talk about mathematical modelling, and uh, they talk about that normally in contradistinction with uh, statistical modelling. And that's a bit of a weird piece of terminology, because obviously a statistical model is mathematical, right? So what's, what is the difference between a mathematical model and a statistical model? It's kind of the difference between thinking about mechanism and phenomenology. Right? So if you want to uh, think about a different, so you can use a statistical model to try and understand patterns and describe and summarize data. But if you want to think about what's going to happen in a, in a different future, you need a model that actually includes the things that are going to be different in the future, right? So, for particularly for questions around uh, infectious disease, where some of the interventions you might be thinking about are designed to reduce transmission, you need a model that actually explicitly includes in it transmission. Otherwise, how can you ask? 
what the future is going to look like if you if, if you did it. So I think that that's one of the principal uses of mathematical modelling actually is to think about interventions and predict their impact and their cost effectiveness. And in in the field of childhood TB, that uh, particularly means things like you know improving diagnostics, uh, thinking about household contact tracing. That's something that you you definitely really need a uh, uh, a model for because there you're talking about finding an adult who's presented, asking them, oh, do you live with some children? Maybe uh, sending somebody to visit their house or asking them to send in children. What you might do to... So that, that kind of intervention, uh, you really need a, a, a mathematical model to try and understand the... Yes, yes. So that was the approach we took. We, we did this on a basically a country by country basis for, uh, I think it was about 180 countries. We had kind of a, a criterion, a cutoff for. So this is India, this, this graph. I've got, I, I realised this is very abbreviated. We had a criterion for the country being larger than 100,000, so you didn't have a hugely noisy uh, trend. But I think we had a coverage of about 97% you know, of the world's population. And yeah, we did it country by country using a mixture of uh, kind of modelled data based on uh, prevalence estimates, typically more recently, but also uh, kind of systematic review of uh, nationally representative TST surveys to give an estimate of ARR. So in this graph, which I didn't really explain, you've got you know, historically some TST surveys and then more recently uh, prevalence surveys feeding into what you think the trend in ARR has done over time. And also how uncertain it is. You can see the, the model I've used here to capture that uh, trend. You know, kind of bows out away from the data to tell you that actually you have less idea of what's going on. Certainly a long time ago, you don't have very much idea at all. So one of the other things we looked at was uh, the burden of infection within the last two years, which is sort of more, more of a more related to uh, you know people at higher risk of infection. Which diagram did you mean? This one. So this is about mortality. Okay, well I think we'll call it a day. Thank you very much. People have some more questions later. And next, next up it gives me um, great pleasure to introduce uh, Liz Whitaker, who is a senior clinical lecturer here at Imperial. She's also a consultant in paediatric infectious diseases here at St Mary's. And Liz and I worked in Cape Town together on our PhDs. Liz um, is mainly exploring immunology of children and their response to infectious diseases and how this changes with time. So thank you, Liz. Thank you. Good. So uh, thank you very much. It's very nice to, to give a talk today. And it's lovely to follow feedback for the best explanation I've had of modelling ever. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, so I'm now going to do immunology in 20 minutes or less. Um, so I'll try and keep it uh, brief and basic. And I guess really, as James said at the beginning, the idea is to explain why it's so important that we include paediatrics in research. Um, and children have a lot to offer in terms of what we can understand about disease processes. And I think this is particularly true in immunology where children often um, represent the extreme ends of the spectrum. And so I'm going to highlight for you why children are important to study and then give an extremely brief overview of the current immune response understandings to TB. 
And then a little bit about the differences in the infant immune response uh, from my PhD, both in healthy children and in those who have TB disease. And then just at the end, just some alternative strategies that I think the research field is moving in, in terms of bioinformatics and other more complex research types. Um, so uh, probably familiar with the natural history of TB infection and disease. Um, and this is uh, just a graphic to show that, I need to guess which one of these is, that we have, once you're exposed to TB, um, you develop infection um, and then go on to develop disease. And we know that if you're an adult, you're most likely to, if you develop infection, you have a 10% lifetime risk of going on to develop active pulmonary disease. Um, and that uh, can happen either straight away or it can happen at any time in the future when your immune system is suppressed. So we know that this is what we see in adults. And perhaps about 1% of those adults will go on to get disseminated disease unless they've got a confounding co-infection mm. such as HIV, in which case those proportions change. And disseminated disease includes such things as miliary TB, um, which is we see in the bottom chest x-ray, or TB meningitis. And these are really the severe end of the spectrum. And unfortunately, what we see predom more predom predominantly in children with TB. If you're a child, however, particularly if you're under one or two years of age, you have up to 50% chance of developing disease when you're infected. And if you're one of those unfortunate children, you may then be in about 20% of those who go on to develop disseminated disease. Um, and I think understanding what makes you susceptible to the progression to disseminated disease is really important for understanding of what co constitutes a protective immune response. And so by studying these groups of children who go on quite rapidly to pulmonary disease and disseminated disease, uh, we really hope to try and understand correlates of immune protection. So that's what I did in my PhD. So now I have some lovely pictures that are thanks to Tom Schriever, who's an immunologist in Cape Town that I worked with, just to run through a reminder of how TB is managed by the immune system. And so we've got these lovely innate immune cells, the neutrophils, dendritic cells, and macrophages that first meet the mycobacterium, um, process it, take it up, um, and then pass it on, essentially. And so we know in particular that macrophages are very important and have really eloquent ways of dealing with the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we have a number of cell signaling pathways. Um, the TB is taken up into a phagosome and actually macrophages are in themselves able to kill TB. But what we, is really important is that TB has evolved with us. So normally in a TB lecture, I would show a picture of Tutankhamun at this point because we know that TB has been a problem for adults and um, for humans since the birth of time. And so TB has evolved to live inside our macrophage and that's really how we end up with latent TB infection. Um, and so one of the, some of the factors that we studied um, as part of my PhD were some of the cytokines including TNF, <coughs> IL-1, beta, IL-6 and IL-12, which you know are really important. So the macrophage goes ahead and presents the TB broken up into different antigens to the T cell. Um, and then both the T cell and the macrophage like to talk to each other. Um, and I was exploring predominantly the T cell responses and some of the receptors, the T cells that we looked at were CD4 T cells, gamma delta and regulatory T cells because we know they are important and some of the co-stimulatory molecules. So we know what's really important is the phagosome presents the T cell, the T cell produces interferon gamma, which then stimulates the, phag the macrophage um, to go ahead and to contain TB and helps it to kill the TB itself. And when this works, what you end up with is this successful lesion, and this is what we call a granuloma. So a granuloma is made up of multinucleate giant cells, which contain the, the TB inside, um, as well as T cells around the edges. Uh, we see neutrophils in there, um, and we see a whole host of other cells. And when it all comes together, I said, you get contained of TB. So you inhale your TB, the innate cells come together, they take the macrophages, the macrophages take them to your lymph nodes, need the T cells, the T cells do their job, they bring on interferon gamma, and ultimately TB goes no further. Um, but I think the question really is then, why do we get TB disease, and what's happening to make that happen? So we have this lovely latent infection with successful containment in the granuloma, but then for some reason the granuloma breaks down and we have failure and local dissemination. And I think that's where we were really trying to explore what's the difference. Can we, um, using children as a model because they get the more severe end of the spectrum, understand more quickly what's happening at this time point. And we know there are a few things from our practice clinically, and this is where translational medicine is so important, that have contributed to our understanding of TB um, disease and progression. So we know from HIV that CD4 T cells are really important. We know from um, um, Mendelian, from a variety of gene defects, that interferon gamma and IL-12 pathways are important. We know that if you have too many or too few neutrophils, that you can get granuloma breakdown. Um, I'm hoping to show you that regulatory T cells are important 
And for more recent extensive biomarker studies, the type 1 interferon pathway appears to me more important. So I hope I've just a very quick overview of what we know about TB and the immune response in adults. There haven't been as many studies in children, and that's really something we need to address as a community. Um, but there have been studies looking at a variety of healthy children um, to show that their immune responses are not the same. And this obviously has an influence when we understand why children go on to develop severe disease. So um, what we know, for example, we talked about innate cells initially, is that neonatal immune responses are very different to adults. So this is um, a figure which has been taken out of a paper by Toby Coleman, who's done a lot of work looking at TLR signaling. And he just demonstrates that adults and neonates have very different immune responses. And in a review paper in Immunity in 2012, he highlights it really quite nicely just to show that neonates in particular have less interferon gamma, less IL-12, and less TNF-alpha, which I've just told you are really important for containment of TB. But that in conjunction with that, they have a more pro-inflammatory um, picture with lots of IL-6 and IL-1. And some other studies have demonstrated that too much IL-6 and too much IL-1 are also responsible for granuloma breakdown. So it's already looking like just by being a young person, the immune cytokine milieu that you are surrounded in is going to make you more susceptible to disseminate the disease. So clearly these are things that we need to explore as part of our understanding of immune correlates of protection, but also to think about when we're developing a vaccine, what kind of immune response do we want to trigger in a child? And the TLR responses tell us about the adjuvants that we might use in that vaccine and how children will respond to them. So some of these studies are really important. Um, so following on from this, what's quite interesting is that you might think that these children would not be able to respond to BCG. So BCG, as um, Beata mentioned originally and Pete alluded to, is um, the vaccine that we have against TB. It's an imperfect vaccine. We've been using it forever. It's probably the vaccine that's been given to more children than um, any other vaccine in the world. And we don't really know how it works. And what it does do is protect children from progressing to TB disseminated disease with TB meningitis. That is probably the only thing that it really does in terms of protection. There's a little bit of evidence that it may decrease your infection a little bit, and it may protect you a little bit from pulmonary disease. So understanding BCG responses is really important. So back in 2001, one group looked at secreted cytokines, and infants are in the unfilled vials and adults in the... What we can see is that they demonstrated that on secreted cytokine data following stimulation with PPD, which is basically mushed up tuberculosis, that children were, infants were as capable as adults of producing interferon gamma, but when they looked at PHA, which is a non-specific stimulant, actually infants were not as good. So this is telling us that actually kids and small children have quite good T cell responses, which are um, it's really important. In my TB, in my PhD, in my TB, in my PhD, I actually looked at the CD4 T cells themselves and showed that there was absolutely no difference with age, looking at four different age groups, depending on susceptibility, in their BCG-induced CD4 interferogamma T cell responses. But interestingly, with SEB, which is a non-specific immune um, stimulant, we see an increase with age. So there is a maturation of the way that our T cells are handling non-specific responses, which may be due to some difficulties in innate and processing um, and signaling, but that actually their antigen-specific responses are really robust and equivalent. Um, so I think that this is something that's also come out in the vaccine literature. So this, oh, I think I've skipped, sorry. I, this is actually just to show, sorry, I forgot, that I also looked at gamma delta T cells, which, um, so gamma delta T cells are a link between uh, the innate and the adaptive immune response. And interestingly, gamma delta T cells also have a maturation with age. So unlike CD4 T cells, which are equivalent in all age groups, the gamma delta T cells um, um, were less good at producing interferon gamma in response to BCG stimulation in children under one and under two years of age. So this just brings together that question about is the problem that children have more related to the innate immune response rather than the adaptive immune response, and how relevant is that for um, ongoing research? So many of the studies that we um, have looked at, that many of the vaccine studies, have focused on <coughs> interferon gamma producing CD4 T cells as correlate of protective immunity because we know that they're so important um, both from the HIV field and from genetic um, uh, mutations. And the top graph here is from Ben Kabina, who also did the studies in Cape Town. And this is a study that looked at children. They took blood from infants 10 weeks after they were vaccinated with the BCG. And it was a longitudinal study. It followed them up for several years. And then it identified all the children who developed TB disease, um, as well as children who got TB infection and healthy children. And what you can see is that there's no difference in the interferon gamma producing groups in, in terms of their responses to BCG. 
these women polyfunctional with controls are those that produce liver cytokines, IL-2 and TNF. And so I think this was indicating that perhaps focusing on adaptive T-cells or CD4 T-cell immunity wasn't going to be an answer to correlates of immune protection. The bottom two graphs are from a paper by Michelle Tamaris in The Lancet, and this was um, the results of the MVI 85A vaccine study. So this was a novel TB vaccine, which I think was the great hope of the TB vaccine field. But unfortunately, this um, phase two study, which was an efficacy trial, demonstrated that unfortunately it was no more efficacious than BCG on its own. And I think that's an important point because it wasn't in comparison to nothing. And it brings us back to the fact that BCG, whilst not being brilliant, is probably quite good in its own right. And what they demonstrated similarly to the Kagina study um, is that polyfunctional T cells um, are induced by the MVI, MVA 85A as well as interferon gamma producing CD4 T cells, but that there's no difference in TB case outcome following the use of this vaccine. So as part of my PhD, I also looked at TB disease. Um, and this is just a very brief summary of some of the findings. And what we can see is that in TB disease versus healthy, they have less IL-1 beta, less TNF, cytokines, um, and, and that also the gamma delta T cells are substantially decreased compared to the healthy T cells. So this kind of innate picture, this pro-inflammatory picture is quite immune suppressed. But interestingly, their CD4 responses were unaffected. This was a little bit of a surprise because other groups have demonstrated that CD4 and gamma T cell responses can be suppressed in TB disease. But I don't know whether this is a factor of um, the cohort, the population that we looked at, but we didn't find it in my study. So this is a broadly immunosuppressed state. And the other T cell group that I was quite interested in looking at were the uh, regulatory T cells because studies have shown that children have higher levels of regulatory T cells than adults. And I wondered if that contributed to their susceptibility to severe disease. And what we found indeed was that children with TB disease have an increased um, frequency of CD, um, so these are proxy 3 CD25 T regs with the CD39 marker which are known to be functional T cells. And so they were increased in TB disease compa compared to healthy controls. And in conjunction with this IL-10, which is a regulatory cytokine, was also increased. Um, so what was interesting about this is that this didn't distinguish between pulmonary and extrapulmonary disease, which I have to say was a slight blow because I was hoping that I'd uh, fallen onto something lovely, which was that severe disease and regulatory T cells were closely tied together. Um, and this wasn't the case in our cohort. Um, but this may be due to a numbers game, and perhaps this needs to be repeated in a larger study. But we end up with the question, it's a chicken or egg. Is this a state that's induced by TB, or did these children get TB because they had a different immune response? In order to try and answer that question, we repeated the assays when the children were well, and I think what we've shown is that it's a disease-specific state rather than a host response, because all of these um, things that were different either improved or um, uh, actually many of them were boosted probably through an immune boosting state. So the Tregs and the interferon gamma producing gamma, D gamma delta T cells, which the two I've shown here, came back up to normal or greater than normal. So we knew that the chicken came first. So I think um, in summary, we developed a slide to kind of try and think of what are the things that make you susceptible to TB disease. So this is a graphic that we're pulling together for a paper we're writing about immune susceptibility. And so we know that many things are important. We know that the gamma, the gamma delta T cells, probably the NK T cells, which a role in protecting you from moving down this path from infection. Too much of anything, and it's the Goldilocks phenomenon again that things can go in the wrong direction. Um, and I think we don't know which of these things at the top are really important. We know BCG probably hopefully prevents you from going in that direction. Does co-infection push you in that direction? So we know Hellman's infection can probably do that. And um, recently in the literature, it suggests that CMV may play a role in this state. Um, your nutritional state and vitamin D deficiency are probably quite important. And I think these are things that really need to be asked about children in particular, but also about patients with TB disease. So I think in summary, we know that children have different innate immune responses, but that they have really robust CD4 antigen-specific responses. We know that regulatory T cells are probably quite important in TB disease. And then the question is, do we need to look at different pathways or do we just need to take a completely different approach? I think we need to stop focusing on CD4 and for gamma T cells. They're obviously important, but they're not the key. Um, and the question is whether we keep looking in this kind of detailed functional analysis, which I think plays a role, but it probably plays a role hand in hand with bigger studies. So there have been a couple of interesting studies recently that have suggested that the interferon gamma pathway is quite interesting. Um, a number of uh, our group have looked at um, RNA expression and whether that could be beneficial in distinguishing between TB disease. 
Um, and Robin Bassey Roy, who is one of my colleagues, has developed this table where he summarised the literature to date. And the slight, I'm not going to go through it, the slightly depressing thing is the nun, 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 which is of all the studies that we've done, we found very few clues as to what is um, the key to susceptibility to progression to disease. But I don't think we should be disheartened. I think we probably need to just keep digging and we need to remember to focus on children. Um, and I think that probably this latent TB cohort is the group that we need to focus on to try and understand which of those patients to identify um, and who of those are at greatest risk of moving on to TB disease. Um, and indeed, I think that this is something that's um, of great interest to the TB field. The study by Zach et al. Have, I think they've identified an RNA signature that may make you susceptible to, um, to identify which patients with latent infection are susceptible to develop progressive TD disease. So I think the question was, why do some children get TB? And does immunology have all the answers? Well, I think, obviously, I think yes, but I think not yet. Um, so I think that is my question. Thank you, Thank you very much, Liz. That's a lovely talk. Really summarised a lot of complicated ideas in a very clear way. Um, have we got any questions on that? Yeah, Nick. Yeah, thank you. That was a lovely talk. Um, this may not be an entirely fair question. It wasn't quite your focus, but you mentioned type 1 interferons yes. as being a risk factor for severe disease, but we usually think of those as being involved in the sort of mm. infections and being on the antiviral pathway. So could you I, I know nothing about TB. So All right. I know. <laughs> it isn't my area of expertise, <laughs> uh, but I, I think that it's interesting and I think it ties in with the innate findings that were highlighted in, in my PhD, which is that it clearly is before the CD4 pathway is happening that that is so important. And I think there are probably people in the room who know more about this than I do. I'm just looking for anybody to point a finger at. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know exactly, but I think that, that that is something we need to explore further in terms of more functional assays rather than a, a bioinformatics field. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah. So Mm. What to do about that? And, and it looks it's along the same lines as the RNA signature. Inflammatory. So it's not a viral, it's not a viral, it's not the disease, it's a co-infection. Well, I think that is a question that's being asked, is the co-infection question, and whether that's what triggers it, that you happily, that perhaps, and the provocative thing would be that latent infection is not a bad thing, that perhaps that having a little bit of, of TB of TB activation in your immune response protects you when you keep being exposed to TB, but it's only when that balance goes out of kilter with a co-infection that you go on to develop disease. So that is an hypothesis, but what you do about that or how you manipulate that in a vaccine setting is probably the interesting question. There are other models for studying latent infection, and this is clearly not my field. I'm, I met in the primate field. We know that the mice model is imperfect, but we keep doing these experiments in mice. Um, the, um, we know that guinea pigs and, uh, are probably a better model, but they're a more expensive animal model to work with. Um, and then the zebrafish model um, is one that's primates, yeah. primates are the main thing. Non human primates are the main thing. Yeah.
I think this is, um, there's been a number of studies recently that have shown that HLA-DR, which is a T-cell activation marker, um, um, can be associated with an increased risk of progression to disease. Um, and we know that um, T-cell activation, CMV can result in T-cell activation. So there's a question about whether, um, why having a co-infection with something like CV or potentially other viruses. I think we're focusing a lot on CMV, which is an example of a hot topic at the moment may induce T-cell activation, which changes the cytokine milieu and the balance, that build up balance, into a, a, a pro-inflammatory state, which destabilizes the granuloma and leads you to be more susceptible. We'll have lots of time for questions at the end of it all when we're trying to bring it together. Thank you very much, Liz. <laughs>
can assume therefore it will work in children and concentrate on the things in children that are important to do. And the things that are important to do are to develop child-friendly formulations. This is a photo that a friend of mine sent me uh, a couple of days ago, actually, where she had a, a master's student who's developed some gummy bears with um, TV medicines in them. And we need child-friendly formulations. We also need to understand the pharmacokinetics a bit better. Uh, and we need to understand toxicity, which is uh, age-specific. So efficacy, traditionally, people have assumed, do that in adults, concentrate on formulations, pharmacokinetics and toxicity. And children, as Liz was also alluding to from an immunological perspective, are very different from um, adults in lots of other ways. So I had to look up what the word integuminary meant, but it means skin, basically. So their skin changes with age, their, um, their, their renal function changes with age, their gastrointestinal function, they have different amounts of body fat, and their size cream 450 and the liver change with age. So dramatically changes, children are changed dramatically, the way they process drugs changes, the amount you put in their mouth to what serum level it leads to in the blood changes dramatically with age. So we have to do pharmacokinetic studies to understand what level, what amount of drug to give children to lead to a certain exposure in the blood serum. And so people have come up with this sort of traditionally this idea that we shouldn't be doing studies earlier in children, we should be protecting them. But at the same time we don't want children to get left behind. So we do need to be doing studies in children but in a staged manner. So when we're starting to do, and this is in the drug development of new drugs, when you're doing the PK intolerability studies in adults, you don't need to be doing any studies in children. When you're starting to do the early bactericidal studies and the PK studies in adults with TB, at that point you should be thinking about developing new formulations for children. When you're doing the, the, sort of the early phase trials of sputum culture conversion in two to four months, that's when you should be doing PK studies in children. And then when you start doing big RCTs in adults, then start doing small tolerability studies and PK studies and using the drug as compassionate use. And it's using this mechanism, you, get to, you would get to a point, if you did this, where when you license a drug in adults, you're ready to go with children. So you're not lagging along with them. And we haven't done this for many of the children's regimens. What we've happened is the whole adult cascade has gone off. And then once we get to this point, we then start in children. And if we do that, then we're always going to be behind the, you know, behind the curve in terms of developing medicines for children. So how are we treating children with TB today? And the bottom line is, it's a bit, you know, we're not doing brilliantly. So if you have drug-susceptible infection, um, we give either six months of isoniazid every day or three months of isoniazid and rifampicin. There is this good option to give isoniazid and rifapentin, which you only have to give once a week for three months, but we don't give it to anyone in this country. In fact, we don't give it to anyone in the world outside the US because of regulatory formulation issues and price. And this is, again, one of these scandals where this drug has been around for literally decades, and we are not giving the best available drug to children because of the children have not been on that pipeline of development as they should have been. For drugs susceptible TB disease, we're giving two months of isoniazid and rifampicin, pyrazinamide, nifambutol, followed by four months of isoniazid and rifampicin. And then if they've got meningitis or, or spinal TB, we give them a longer course. And this is really long treatment um, for, for drug susceptible TB. If we've got MDR TB, an infection, we don't really know how to manage these. So either we're giving some kind of preventive therapy with a fluoroquinolone or we're not doing anything. And we don't really know how best to manage these children. And if we're treating disease with children with MDR TB, we're giving long, long, long courses for nearly two years with at least five drugs. These are very toxic drugs. We're giving six months of a daily injection to them. Often 25 to 50 percent of children lose hearing. And we've had two new drugs, Dilamidin and Bedaquiline, now being licensed for three or four years, being used pretty widely in adults. And again, we haven't got formulations, we haven't got PK, we don't know how to use these children, and they're not licensed for, for anyone under 18. So this is where, for these two new drugs, we're way behind in that cascade. We should be using these drugs in children. So, I've said that we don't need to do efficacy trials in children because they can be done in adults. But there are, th I think, sometimes when we should be doing trials in children. And really, I think we should be doing them when, A, there is a pathophysiological difference in the disease between children and adults. And what springs to mind for me is TB meningitis, where I think it is different in children to adults. I think when their risk of disease progression from infection to disease is higher than adults, and I think that the reason why uh, we should do those trials in children is because actually you're going to get a result much quicker and much more efficiently because children are at higher disease. And they do have unique elements to their, um, their disease progression, which are different to adults. 
And then I think one of the biggest reasons is where we're saying efficacy, if you can prove it in adults, you can assume it in children. But the converse may be possible. It may be that you can actually get away with lighter treatments. Yes, probably these long toxic regimens we give adults, they probably will treat children, but actually we could get away with, with limited, more limited, shorter um, treatments because children don't have so severe um, treatment. And that's where something like a non-inferiority type of design might come in. You might be able to compare a child who's got limited disease with the conventional adult type regimen and compare a softer, milder treatment that might be just as good. And then you, you, you're not trying to show it's better, you're trying to show it's as good, but it's safer. And so what does that mean in terms of what the landscape is at the moment for paediatric um, trials? So there is the SHINE trial, which has started randomising and recruiting children. This has taken place in a number of sites in Africa and in India. And what the premise here is, is that actually we can maybe get away with shorter treatment for children with drug-susceptible limited TB. So children have quite well-described limited disease, so they've got to be smear negative, they've got to have sort of relatively mild chest x-rays, not with cavities or anything else and these are being randomized to a four month regimen or a six month regimen and this is a non-inferiority design is it can you get away with four months is that as good as not better is it as good as because surely it's better to give four months of treatment than um, than six months of treatment the next trial um that is is going to be uh, starting recruitment in the next few months is uh the tb champ trial which is a prevention trial so this is taking children who've been exposed to ndr tb and it's saying, can we give them a medicine to prevent them developing MDR-TB disease? And this um, trial is randomising children under five who've been exposed in their house to MDR-TB to levofloxacin every day for six months or placebo. And they'll be followed up for a couple of years to see how many of them develop disease. Um, at the moment, there's a huge amount of uncertainty about how we should be managing these children. And hopefully this and a couple of other trials in adults which are going ahead will shed some light on this matter. There are a couple of trials on TB meningitis, and I think people are feeling we should be a bit more excited and a bit more exciting about um, how we manage meningitis. We're using medicines traditionally that don't really get into the brain. We're using medicines at the wrong dosages. And so people have been doing some um, pharmacokinetic modeling to figure out what is the best dosage to give into the mouth that will get the right drug in the blood, which will give the right concentration in the CSF. And so this is one trial which has now started recruiting in Malawi and in India, TBM kids. Um, and this is using high doses of rif um, rifampicin, up to 30 milligrams per kilogram, and using a fluoroquinolone in the intensive phase in a couple of the arms, um, it, as opposed to the control. And this is really a PK and safety study. There are only a, there's 100 or so kids in this study to see if it's safe to give these dosages and to see what happens to their outcome. It's not quite powered to do uh, a full efficacy study. This is a, a, a trial, the SURE trial, which is, is moving through various funding agencies. And this trial is a much bigger trial, and it's looking to randomise children to the conventional one-year treatment for TB meningitis against six months of treatment with a much higher dosages for drugs, um, high-intensity treatment. Um, and again, it's non-inferiority. It's saying, is it as good to treat for six months as 12 months, but with better drugs? At the same time, factorial design to see whether aspirin gives some benefit. So all the children are randomised twice. They're randomised first to the intervention of 12 months or 6 months, and they're also randomised to get aspirin or placebo. And this, again, is a multi-site trial. Smart Kids trial. So this is a Steve Jobs, for those of you who, uh, who might have put it. So this is thinking about drug-resistant TB. And again, the theory is this is children just under 13 years old, so children with more limited disease, children without the cavities and the severe forms of disease. Can you get away, and the experimental arm here is six months of treatment, two months of dilamidid, clofazamine, linezolid, levofloxacin, and pyrazinamide, followed by four months of a lower dose of linezolid. But so these are exciting drugs. These are new drugs. They're very bactericidal. They have good sterilizing effect. If you have good drugs, you don't need to treat these children for nearly two years. Maybe you can get away with six months. And actually, the experimental, uh, the control arm in this trial is this new um, shortened regimen of about nine to 12 months which has been recently endorsed by WHO, but um, is not really being used anywhere. And then having an observational arm of pre-XDR and XDR TB. So these, again, this is going through the NIH funding mechanism, but um, what, what we are saying is that finally, having there been literally no paediatric TB trials ever until about three or four years ago, there suddenly is some excitement to do trials in children, because in certain populations, it's only by doing the study in children that you can answer those specific questions. So... Kind of in conclusion, 
we do need to protect children from unnecessary exposure to experimentation. If you can do a trial that answers a question in adults, that you can extrapolate the answer to children, then you should do it in adults. You shouldn't be doing this in children. But there are certain circumstances when you do need to do it right in children. I think, though, that if we're not going to do the trials in children, we need to make sure that the other elements of, um, of development do take place. We need to have the formulations available. We need the pharmacokinetics. We need the safety um, so that by the time a new drug or a new regimen or new treatment is licensed in adults, we're ready to go with that treatment in children. Um, but I would say that having there been absolutely no movement in this sort of space for a very long time, it's suddenly quite exciting and suddenly there are new drugs coming in, there are new regimens coming through and there's lots happening in the paediatric TV world at the moment. So um, watch this space, I think this will change a lot in the next few years. Thank you. Any questions? I think that's, that's a really central point. And, um, and the bottom line is they are there and people are just ignoring them. Um, because it's definitely not in anyone's um, interest. Or it's not in the drug developer's interest to do studies in children. They're expensive. They have very low yield in terms of market capacity. You have to develop all these new formulations which hardly get used. So it's really not very cost effective to develop them. Now the FDA and the EMA both have um, essential components that you have to have a paediatric drug development plan in all their drug development. Um, protocols and, and in theory drugs should not be licensed unless this what that schema I showed is followed but because people are desperate for these drugs they they apply for waivers so both Dilamidin and Dilaxin have kind of got around this by by effectively saying we're desperate for these drugs the adults need them um, yes we will do the pediatric development plan but let's get the adult drugs out there now because there's and a lot of the advocacy to do that as well and so so I think it, it, is, it is challenging, but yes, it should, it should be mandated by the regulators, and, and it is, but people are still finding ways around it. in the foot by demanding that every single drug should have a special licensure in children then. So having these uh, PDPs has clearly you know, brought its own challenges and we are now facing this incredible delay. I mean, we were all the first people to say, oh well, no, all these drugs out there were too early, we're never tested in children every week. Brought in children, it must be regulated. And now we're in a situation where we're saying, oh, this is actually impeding us from getting things through because the companies are not prepared to go down that line because it's very... Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say it's challenging because all the other drugs we're using to treat children with drug-resistant TB are not, you know, we don't have any PK data, we don't have appropriate formulations, and we're using them, and they are the recommended drugs to be used. Yet the new drugs, which are almost certainly safer and less toxic, we're not able to use because they haven't gone through this process. So you are in this ridiculous situation, really. I personally think you need novel funding mechanisms for this. You need to, either international or national agencies need to step up um, and provide a pool of funding which supports the development of this kind of formulation because it's, it's really not in the interests of, of drug companies to do this. And fair enough, they are public companies that are responsible for their shareholders. They shouldn't be doing this out of altruism. There needs to be a funding mechanism to support this, this parallel development of drugs for children with I wasn't quite sure at the end. I'm still trying to catch up. Um, what's the evidence of variation, or how much variation is there in the uh, in the progression from instance of disease? Uh, sorry, to instance of disease from infection. So is that fairly constant wherever you look? If you look in Afghanistan or you look in South Africa, is that constant or is it uh, something that varies a great deal?
to vary greatly in its efficacy in different settings. And in fact, in the UK setting, uh, this is I would say that we don't know because actually you can't do a study ethically really identify someone who's been exposed in sex know that there is an efficacious treatment that we know works so it's very difficult to do a study that that's the reason why we're having to use data to really well not be anything to do with what happened in Afghanistan or Malawi or today. Um, but those are really the only data we have because it's just not possible to do that. Yes, I mean, you're, you're sort of jumping ahead of me because I, in a sense it, I wasn't asking what caused it, though that would be the next question. But if you know how much variation there is, you know what there is to explain. If it's all constant, then there's less to explain. I mean, it, it may all just be something that's just a constant something about TB or something about people who are always the same. Whereas if it's something like nutrition or if it's something like um, co-infection or BCG vaccination, then if that explains all of it, you don't have any more to look at, really. You, you, I, mean, I mean, you I might want to know more about the mechanism. I think you don't know, but I suspect it's easy. It's, it's, it's so complicated um, and probably a conflict of many, many things. The further you go away from your sentinel event of the exposure, the less you can be certain that the disease you develop is actually due to that sentinel exposure. If you live in a setting with very high TB going around, then unless you have strains identified from, from both of these sites, you're able to tell whether the TB you get in five, six years is from that, from that exposure. I think we now have better tools to, to get the TB strains, the whole genome sequencing we have from Well, in children, we often rely on getting the strains from their index cells of children. Apart from South Africa, for example, we learn that their intercultural contacts but from some sort of community exposure. Really by nailing it on the microbiology Given you've got a smaller number of drugs available for children, do you think then you're going to end up in a scenario where you've got different strains circulating in the adult population versus the childhood population? And you may get differences in terms of the proportion of drug resistance in those two populations. Um, that's an interesting idea. I mean, I, I think we haven't got massively different drug resistance. Generally, children don't lead to new drug resistance. It's very uncommon for a child to... Most children who have drug resistance to have it because they breathe in a bunch of fluid. Rather than um, for many adults, they start with the drug septal organism, and because they don't have so drug kind of adherence or different from other children. So on the whole, most drug resistance is developed in adults and then transmitted to adults. So I suspect there's not going to be a vast evolution of further drug resistance. It's interesting. I, I don't think that's likely to be the case. But I mean, um, so you talked about some of the newer drugs that are coming out and how they're not available for children. Um, and, for example, bedaquiline has been linked to some problems with QT elongation and things like that, um, which has sparked a discussion about how safe they are, especially in these 
very high burden settings where they don't have good health care anyway and they're not able to monitor these potential side effects. How do you think we can overcome that if you want to give them to children as well? Because we do need new drugs for children. But how can we monitor and make sure they're not having even worse outcomes for children? I mean, I mean that's a good question. Um, but the first of all, the thing with Blackman is, yes, there has been a signal with prolonged PC, but there's, there's really no evidence that that's a clinically relevant um, The second thing is the drugs we're already giving are really horrible and cause ma definite side effects. So Blackman has a theoretical side effect. Injectables we're giving, it makes the tools go up. Um, and then there's the, the sense that, um, that, that, um, that in terms of the, the treatment of. Um, <laughs> I had another point that I was going to make there in the middle of that. No, no. Um, so, so anyway, so just to recap. So, uh, that one, for example, is. Um, it, it, I, I just think it, each case is, is a bit of a risk benefit. I was going to say that actually drug resistance TB in itself is, has very poor outcomes. So I think that um, we have to weigh up risk versus benefit. And I think we've gone down a line of saying if there's any risk associated with the drug, we can't use it. Whereas I think we have to be thinking quite strategically and say, is this drug better than the disease or is this drug better than the current drug? And I think it's just going towards the answer of, hey, it's not 100% safe, but if it's actually showing very limited safety signal, We have to be a bit pragmatic. I think we've, we've swung, and I think the, the kind of agency regulator is very, very protective about not exposing children to any risk. And I think it's I'm a drug resistant TB, and B, even though they're not safe, So, my follow up to that would be because obviously I agree with you that it's the lesser of two evils, we do need new drugs. But how do you convince ethics committees and things like that to be able to do these trials to get these drugs into children? Because obviously, we're very risk adverse at the moment in medicine. So how do you foresee us being able to convince people that we do need to get these drugs out there? Well, I'd be interested to have other people's take on this. I mean, I, I definitely don't have a monopoly on this. I think that's what we're you're substituting one area of speculation with another one. You have the data are going to be the other thing is if we ask patients if we get a stronger view from end user about what they want people about gene therapy um, and then we go and ask they'll tell you that it's such a bad scenario why they uh, they would not be adverse <laughs> it's it's a debate that Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask to what extent uh, your mathematical modeling might be used uh, in order to uh, speak to your um, ethical committees because, you know, if you have no means, if you want, I mean, it's arguments versus arguments or ethical issues, but perhaps how, to what extent with the use of your mathematical modeling with the risk and, and benefits and so on and in terms of treatment, how would, would that work in order to convince, you know, ethical committees or not at all? I think you know a mathematical model is an, is an ideal tool to, to quantify uh, that, that balance between risk and benefit. Evidence to by the nature of saying that. But, you know, 
things don't get to that stage of that. Bad as this, then it's still kind of. I just want to say one thing as well. One thing I think we need to be better at is engaging with ethics committees, with regulators, and speaking. I, I just before Christmas went to the paediatric antiretroviral um, engagement group in Geneva that WHO run, and I was fascinated. Around that table, there were people from the FDA. Advocacy groups, very academic, and this was a group of people who were deciding on the, the development of the pipeline for the next 10 years of antiretrovirals. HIV are doing things that we're just not doing with people. We're not having those roundtable discussions about how we develop drugs, how we take the regulations. drugs and formulations, they were thinking 10 years ahead of what are the regimens we're going to be wanting to use for children with HIV in 10 years, what formulations, what combinations, what dosages, what size pills, how should, many pieces should they break in pieces, and then the, the people from the FDA were there to see that journey, and then they take that to the drugs, you know, the drug they are a long way away from that. Another question um, relating to the role of modelling, and I'm wondering whether it could help with the sort of immunolo immunological studies that Liz is doing, because it's always struck me that in TB, there's a lot of chance involved as well. So a chance whether an exposed person is actually infected, probably a lot of role of chance in when someone progresses from latent to active TB, as well as explanations that are immunological. And I wonder if the modeling approaches that you've applied on a sort of epidemiological basis could also be applied to an immuno immunological basis to just sort of take account of that great deal of uncertainty that there, there is in there. dimension of uh, childhood tuberculosis. So very much 